We are taking you on a trip to one of the most scenic areas of France, the Dordogne River Valley, visiting small towns, chateaux, and historic sites. The home base for the visit is the town of Sarla, which is so wonderful and important that we cover it in a separate movie. In this program, we'll spend our time at 11 different locations in the heart of France, all clustered near the area of the Dordogne River Valley, shown here with the orange line, starting in the north at Fanlac. Driving through these country roads in the off-season was really a pleasure. There was no traffic and beautiful sights like this vineyard with a couple of castles beyond, heading to the tiny hamlet of Fanlac. Here it is. We'd never heard of it before, and you probably never have either, but the tourist office recommended we have a little detour. It's a couple miles off the main road, and just have a look at this charming little peaceful country village. Homes made of limestone, slate tile roofs, surrounded by farmlands and vineyards. Very nice little spot, nice little detour. Just takes about one hour to drive up the little country lane, have a look, drive back down to the main road. As we continue along, we're going to take another little detour, leaving the main road into a little side street to the village of San Leon. Another limestone village, slate tile roofs, and a very peaceful sleepy spot indeed. Most famous for its Romanesque church that dates back to the 11th century. It's one of the finest of the Romanesque churches of the Perigord. The River Vizier flows through San Leon. It's a very peaceful spot, nice place to catch some fish with a cat patiently waiting for his share. Bonjour. Yes, indeed. It's nice to get off the road and get away from the main sites and have a look at some of these little local villages. Rock Saint Christophe is yet another site with a lot of history. We're in the largest rock shelter in all of Europe. It has a commanding view out over the Vezer River Valley. And this overhanging rock shelter housed as many as a thousand people in the Middle Ages. And for 50,000 years before that, had human occupation, starting with the Neanderthals and perhaps even earlier. It's about a kilometer long. That's over half a mile. This is the main part of the rock shelter. This would have been downtown. In the Middle Ages, it was a virtual cliff city. In this particular spot, there would have been about 30 houses. They've done a fine job here creating these small models and some reconstruction showing you what the village was like in the Middle Ages. Of course, this was occupied many thousands of years earlier, way back in the time of prehistory, when it may have just been a simple open rock shelter. But in the Middle Ages, they made it into a complete covered village, occupying five levels of the cliff face. Really quite remarkable. And you get a feeling of the scale here. This is the largest, longest rock shelter terrace in all of Europe a kilometer long, about six tenths of a mile. And you can see it would have been a well-defended spot. And yet they didn't have a source of water, so they had to haul all the water up, all the food, all the supplies. And these pulleys were built during the Middle Ages to supply the village with its essential supplies. They've got their own blacksmith shop here, and the tools are still in place. These are reproductions of the time period. There's a little barn, there's a chapel, there's different living areas, habitation areas, all set in this fantastic rock cliff setting. This is believed to be the oldest carved stone staircase in Europe. Here's a Bronze Age burial a reconstruction and the Neanderthals fighting off the bears in another vivid reconstruction here in this Terrific rock shelter, Rock Saint Christophe. From below, you really get a feeling of the scale of this massive limestone cliff, riddled with caves and rock shelters. 
you purchase your ticket at the gift shop entrance and the guide there can tell you a little bit about the site. Oh, it's a cliff with different period of occupation. Mm -hmm. You have uh, oh, Neanderthal man. Uh, Neanderthal was 50,000 years ago. Yeah, and uh, cro -Magnon. Mm -hmm. And they did archaeological excavations and... Yes, yes. It's uh, very special, very special. Bainak Castle is perched on top of a 490-foot-high limestone cliff. This was one of the most important and powerful castles in medieval France. And there's a beautiful village at the foot of it with buildings that date back to the 15th century through the 17th century. They're doing quite a bit of restoration now. Back in the 19th century, many of these French country villages were dilapidated and abandoned but recent years have seen a great revival in fixing them up. There are some lovely restaurants in the village down below. Even though it's the off season, we're traveling in early December, these restaurants stay in business with a local clientele. So you know they must have a very good quality. You wanna head up to the top of the hill to see the castle itself. It's surrounded by a medieval village and then you can go right up to the castle gates, pay your admission, and visit inside Bainak Castle. It was a great stronghold because during the Hundred Years' War, the Dordogne River Valley was the border between the French and the English territories. The castle was primarily under French control, but it did change hands several times, and it was captured by Richard the Lionheart in 1195 for the English. Just across the valley, you can see the castle of Castelnau, where we're going to visit next. That was occupied by the British. We're visiting yet another stone monster, a giant castle up on the hill, the Chateau de Castelnau. This was originally built in the early 13th century and burned down and knocked down and rebuilt several times since then. There's a medieval village at the foot of the castle that was part of its defenses with somewhat of a torturous series of alleys and little hills. And then you enter into the castle proper. It's a museum today, privately owned, a listed historic building and a great experience. This is one of the great defensive fortifications that played an important role in the Hundred Years' War. Many castles that you see did not actually go through a lot of warfare. They were fortunate ones, but this castle changed hands many times. There was ongoing wars between the British and the French throughout France and in the Dordogne Valley in particular here, where you have one castle after another occupied by either the British or the French. This was kind of a border between their two territories. So this castle changed hands between the English and the French, they say, about five or six times during the Hundred Years' War. It was the scene of a lot of heavy fighting. Then later in time, after the French Revolution in the late 1700s, it was used as a stone quarry. And unfortunately, part of it was ruined, but then it was restored in the 19th and particularly in the mid 20th century they did a lot of work to bring it back to its former glory as a great castle. The owners have done a fine job of renovating the interior and they've created a museum of the Middle Ages, which primarily features medieval weapons and small models and reconstructions of some medieval machinery that was used to help operate the castle. Walking out through the Barbican, this was a fortified gate and beyond another fortified tower to protect the flanks of the castle. Massive stone construction, a series of trebuchets, the giant slings were used to knock down the stone walls of other castles. Of you looking down at the village below, there are still people, of course, living in these medieval homes today maintaining them and keeping them alive with a great spirit. 
be sure to visit Castelnau in your visit to the Dordogne. Coming up next, one of the finest sights in the entire region. One could hardly imagine a more scenic river village than La Roque Jacques. It is nestled right alongside the banks of the Dordogne River. In fact, it was a trading village and a fishing village back in the Middle Ages when it had a population of 1,500 people. Seems like the stone buildings have just grown up organically out of the cliff and up from the ground. Well, be sure to walk up this pathway to the little lane that runs through the middle of the village rather than just simply looking at it from the riverfront. Because when you're in the midst of the village, you really get a unique perspective. A troglodytic fort. These were some cliff dwellings that were constructed way back, they say, around the time of the Viking invasions in the 10th century, where the local people were building these to fortify themselves and defend themselves against Viking attacks. The village grew and prospered throughout the 1400s and the 1500s. Today, it's a charming tourist town and with some cat attractions. We're about to witness some cat theatrics, a bit of a cat opera. <coughs> Having a bit of a disagreement there in the treetops. These two pals obviously grew up together in this little village. And while we're up at this lofty vantage point, we enjoyed the view looking out across the Dordogne Valley as the sun began to sink behind the hills. It gave us quite a view. There's a 20th century neo-Gothic castle at one end of the village. And then we enjoyed the most spectacular sunset of our entire two week visit in France. So this was a great place to linger and just enjoy the view, looking at these beautiful pink clouds reflected in the Dordogne River down below. And then the village itself took on another life with the twilight. This is the magical hour when you have that mix of twilight, sunset, street lights, ambient lighting, all come together in this golden glow and such a spectacular setting for such a light show. La Roque Jacques. Then we continue on to one of the major towns of the area, Belvez, famous as the site of seven towers, medieval towers that date back. And there's a main street that's for pedestrians as usual. And in this case, it's early December and nobody's home. The town was really quite empty. The town square has a 15th century covered market and several of the noted towers. There are really charming buildings in Beldez. It's set on a hilltop from which you can have some commanding views across the countryside. And there are a few of these pedestrian lanes that emanate out from that central square including a narrow alley that leads you to the Archbishop's Palace, indicating that this really was a fairly important town back in its day. Sometimes you'll be reading a guidebook and some obscure little reference catches your eye, such as mention of the hamlet of Urval. Well, it sounded like a good idea, so we drove over to take a look, and here it is. There's only about 10 buildings clustered here, but it is quite charming, especially with the little duck pond and swans gliding through it. A cluster of homes. There's even a little post office here. The hamlet of Urval. Just a little detour and another side trip. There are a number of towns that were specifically built as fortifications in the Middle Ages. They were called Bastide, and one of the most famous is the town of Dom, 
We're heading there. It's a drive that takes about an hour from anywhere because it's up on a hill. It's an isolated little fortified town, but it's worth the visit. There's a wall around it and several gates you drive right in. And the town itself is a relic of the Middle Ages. It was first founded in the year 1293 and built up over the centuries. It played a role in the Hundred Years' War. It changed back and forth from the British hands to the French hands and to the British and back to the French. Here's the main street, the Grand Rue. There's shops here. There's people still living in the town. There's lots of school kids out in the daytime as well. It's not just an empty relic anymore by any means. This is a real major tourist attraction in the Paragord region. It attracted some artists in its day. The writer Henry Miller loved the place. There are some fine views from the hilltop and a little park with a bench. You can sit down and rest up and then continue on your way out through that same wall, through another gate, continuing on your journey. We're heading to the town of Rocomador, passing some walnut orchards. These are one of the great food crops of the area. Rocomador is an amazing little village, as you'll soon find out. It was originally a pilgrimage village from the Middle Ages, and it's clinging to a limestone cliff overlooking this vast valley. It's still a pilgrimage village today, although we were visiting in the off season and you'll see it was rather empty. It's a spectacular setting. You've got three levels, the chateau on the top, the sanctuary in the middle and the village down below. And you can drive right to it, especially here in the off season, no problem with parking. This is a weekday and yet most of the shops were closed, hotels were closed, restaurants were closed, the shutters were drawn, but there is the chateau magnificently perched above the village. It's a walled village. In medieval times, it was actually fortified, keep the enemies away. Now it's very peaceful, of course, very tranquil and quiet. They say that in the Middle Ages, on a busy day, there'd be as many as 30,000 pilgrims. The cheese shop was one of the few places open, and so we stopped for a bite and a taste. And this is a blue goat cheese, and this is a blue sheep cheese, which is one of my favorites. Mm. You want to taste? Yeah. Very tasty. Okay. And this is a cantal. It's a cow cheese. And this town is very quiet today, huh? Yeah, but you know, it's not the season. The tourist information office was closed, but the cheese lady was very friendly and filled us in on some of the history, which dates back to the 12th century. This is the staircase that pilgrims would climb and still do today on their knees for special blessings. But I advise you, you go down. This is what you have to see here. By walking, you go here, you visit everything, and you go down. You can see the sanctuary from here, and it's very, very beautiful to see. Rocamador is three floor, okay? You're here, this is a city where you are. Mm -hmm. And normally you come here, you go to the stairs, mm -hmm. and this is what you have to do on your knees. Visit the sanctuary on your knees too, and go to the castle. Mm -hmm. Normally, you have to to do the pilgrim way, you know, mm -hmm. on your knees, mm -hmm. and so you will be forgiven for all the eternity. You have to do it on your knees. Normally, this is a rule, you know. So uh -huh. you have to go there. <laughs> there is the sanctuary at the mid level, and you can walk up to it through the staircase or take the funicular. Well, we weren't about to spend a few hours doing the climbing, and so instead we got back in the car and we're on our way, continuing along to the next destination in our adventures through the Dordogne Valley. Now we're taking a deep dive into the prehistory of the area when Stone Age people lived here. The ancient prehistory of mankind is one of the great attractions of the Dordogne region. And the center of that historical studies is in this village of Les Aziz. This is the home of the National Historical Museum. You see it at the top underneath that overhanging cliff. 
We'll be paying a visit inside the museum. But first we walk out through this pleasant little village and admire the natural outcrop and cliff. These cliffs and caves are one of the reasons why early humans and pre-humans, our ancestors, were attracted to this area as far back as 400,000 years ago and the time of the Neanderthal men. The Ice Age came down through Northern Europe, the Second Ice Age, and it was so cold that it forced these early human ancestors to travel south into this part of France for protection. And these caves provided natural homes for them. The Museum of Prehistory reopened in the year 2004, but originally built in 1918. It has one million objects in here that date back to the early Stone Age. They have wonderful exhibits that show you how these stone tools were crafted by the Neanderthal people and the earlier ancestors, the ancestors of Cro-Magnon Man. Cro-Magnon Man was also found in this region. He's the earliest modern human dates back to about 40,000 years ago. The various stone tools represent the different periods of Stone Age technology. The old Paleolithic, the Mesolithic, divided into different sections. They've got reconstructions of what some of the hunters look like. The different historical periods were called, for example, Mousterian and Orignation. There's stone art here as well. Some carvings in the walls and Nearby are some painted caves, some of the earliest art ever created by mankind. You see how this rock shelter would have provided a natural home for these early humans. And the village is nestled right down below it. Les Aziz is quite an attractive little village. And there is a very informative tourist information office where Emily told us all about the surrounding villages, gave us some tips as to where to go driving and sightseeing. The tourist advisor gives us a brief recap of the journey we've been taking and other sites in the area. Mm -hmm. With La Maison Fort de Reignac, it's a, a castle. Mm -hmm. uh, La Roque Saint Christophe, it's a city of the Middle Age. Mm -hmm. and after, you can go to La Côte de Jour for the point of view and return in saint leon sur isère This village, it's a beautiful village. Which one? saint leon sur isère mm. mm, okay. And now to our final site of the tour. Set in a lush valley with a beautiful trail leading to it, Font de Gaume is one of the very few painted caves that people are allowed to actually visit. A very rewarding experience. We're at Font de Gaume, which is one of the most remarkable of the painted prehistoric caves in the Dordogne Valley area. It's one of the great landmarks of prehistoric art because there are paintings on the walls inside these caves that date back 15,000 years. They're mostly paintings of bisons and some reindeer and some horses. And it really gives you an idea of the level of development that mankind had already reached 15,000 years ago. It's some of the first painted art ever found in the world. Of course, there are painted caves scattered throughout Europe. You find them in Spain and particularly through the south of France. But this region here is the most famous for a concentration of painted caves. They were using the contours of the caves in part to shape their paintings. So you see some very naturalistic looking, almost three-dimensional bison painted onto the rock wall where there'd be a natural protrusion for the head and a natural protrusion for the body. And it really shows how talented these early humans were. They were hunters and gatherers. And of course, these paintings were all about the hunt because the bison was one of their main foods and the reindeer, another one of their main foods. So the theory is that uh, this was a way of guaranteeing a good hunt. 
It was their homage to the bison, uh, perhaps tied up in their early religion as well. Although very little is actually known since it was 15,000 years ago and there's no written records. That completes our look at some of the fine sights of the Dordogne Valley. We frequently upload new movies, so please subscribe to our channel and click that little alarm bell so you'll be notified. And if you enjoyed the movie, how about a thumbs up and we always welcome comments down below. Or if you have questions about the destination, make note and we'll answer them. Thanks for watching.